So our next, uh, we have a panel coming up, and it's basically uh, continuing on what Dean started to speak about, the art of innovation, the art of what's possible through ideation. And uh, moderating the panel is uh, somebody that is actually one of my favorite people. He's, he's one of my first mentors in starting in my business career. He found me in the uh, mainframe department, if you could believe it. I, I started my career in a, uh, as a COBOL programmer and a systems analyst, and he came to me one day and said, I've got this wireless data network. It runs at 8K per second, and it's called Mobitex, and we've got coverage in four cities in Canada. Do you want to come work on it? And I was like, yeah, I'm in the mainframe part, Barb, and I want to come work on that. So I did, and fast forwarding three years, working with a company out of Waterloo, called Research in Motion. We launched BlackBerry 1999 together. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just awesome for both of us to have ended up at RIM uh, furthering our careers. So first, I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage David Neal. Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to BlackBerry World one more time. This is an astonishing event. The, the scale, the size, it's wonderful. So what we're going to do for the next few minutes is we're going to talk about innovation. Much is discussed about innovation, uh, particularly with respect to technology and wireless. And as you know, companies live and die on their ability to be innovative as well as to be seen as innovative. It's not enough to actually be innovative, you have to be seen as being innovative. Uh, what's particularly interesting is that the internet is actually creating opportunities both for innovation, I mean obviously it triggers opportunity to develop new applications, take advantage of crowdsourcing evolution, but it also allows the opportunity to study innovation. Innovation is quite fascinating, it's an alchemical mix of human thought and circumstance and coincidence and it leads to some very unique, some very compelling products and services. This morning, I'm very fortunate to be joined by three very distinguished guests that spend most of their working lives studying innovation and innovators. So for the next 30 minutes, we're going to attempt to discover more about how innovation works, and more importantly, how my, one might prepare and actually optimize an organization to achieve innovation and we want to talk in particular how innovation in the wireless industry is changing how we interact as humans. So I'd like to introduce my panelists. So let me introduce the guys that I have here this morning. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce first Stephen Johnson. Uh, Stephen spends a great deal of time thinking and writing about innovation and innovators. Uh, most recently a book called Where Good Ideas Come From. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, I have John Jackson. Uh, John is Vice President of Research at CCS Insights. So John gets an opportunity to study innovation and how effective the innovation is in terms of where it gets to in the market. And then I'd like to introduce Tom Kelly, who is the general manager at IDEO. Um, it's an organization that both innovates and helps organizations with innovation. And uh, most recently has written uh, with a colleague a book called The Art of Innovation. So the first thing I'd like to do is actually ask my guests to describe some of their initial observations before we get more into a discussion. So the first thing I'd like to ask you, Stephen, um, in your book, Where Ideas Come From, uh, you've done a lot of looking at the patterns that emerge yeah. when studying big thoughts. I'd like to... Yeah, well, one of the things that I found in, in, in this project of, of looking, in a sense, at environments that lead to unusually innovative thinking, whether they're software environments and platforms or physical environments, um, is that while we often think about competition driving great ideas, there is a, there's a huge role for collaboration and on building on top of and borrowing from other people's ideas and kind of improvising on top of the platform. I'll tell you a quick story that I think captures a lot of that. Um, uh, in 1957, when Sputnik launched, 
um, the first man-made satellite orbiting the planet um, at a physics lab in, in Laurel, Maryland, uh, associated with Johns Hopkins. So there are these two kids there, 25-year-old kids. And this new satellite is orbiting the planet. It's this incredibly interesting, slightly threatening thing. They're trying to figure out what it means. And they decide to listen for it. They think, it must be sending some kind of signal out, right? And so just for fun, really, just as a kind of a lark, as a kind of a hack, they kind of tune in and track down the signal that Sputnik is sending. And then they start to think, gosh, you know, we're seeing this little frequency variation between each of the little beeps that, that Sputnik is sending out. And so they think, wow, we could use the Doppler effect to kind of figure out how fast this thing is moving. And then a couple of weeks later, they start to realize they can look at the slope of the changes to figure out the points at which it's closest to their antenna and the points at which it's furthest away. And by the end of this process, just, just for fun, just as kind of a hobby, they've calculated the exact orbit of this satellite around the planet. About a month later, their boss pulls them in and says, listen, could you do that the other way? Could you take an unknown location on the ground if you knew the location in space and figure out where you were? And they said, yeah, I think we could do that. And so that became the basis of GPS. And you know, for, for 30, 40 years, GPS is a very closed platform run yeah. entirely by the military. But as it gets opened up for kind of civilian use um, over the last 20 years, it turns out to be good at all these amazing things that th these two kids in Laurel, Maryland in 1957 never even dreamed of. And that is, is so often the story of innovation. You follow just this kind of hunch, you follow this idea with no real clear purpose. But because you've created something that's interesting and that other people are able to kind of improvise on top of, great breakthroughs are made. Yeah, and the improvisation on GPS is quite astonishing. Certainly to the extent where people end up in the middle of rivers and marshes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and think about it. Here was a technology that was invented basically to fight the Cold War. And now people are using it to figure out where you know, the nearest soy latte is, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. that's, the, exactly. that's the transformation. Tom. Um, as a company that works with such a wide range of organizations trying to help trigger innovation, um, can you describe some of the things that you recognize that actually help set free the ideas within those organizations? Uh, particularly, how do you encourage new thinking, uh, sure. particularly game-changing ideas? Sure. You know, David, I personally have worked with over a thousand clients. And when it comes to a culture of innovation, uh, you know, over the scope of those decades, I've noticed certain patterns, especially in the last several years. I've noticed that the best and most innovative companies in the world have at least three things in common. And the first thing that they all seem to have in common is a, an idea-friendly environment. They have the kind of environments in which there's a, there's a lot of flow of ideas and they don't let the hierarchy get in the way. Of course, the big shots still get to make the decisions, but they, they're willing to listen to ideas from anywhere in the organization, right? And so they have brainstorming culture. They have the kind of culture in which when you hear an idea, your impulse is to build on it, not to tear it down. You know, because there are other cultures in the world that you, some of you have probably seen in which the devil's advocate reigns, in which you get, you get points for being the clever critic. Right? But in idea-friendly environments, people, people learn to build on those ideas because they're kind of fragile at the beginning. Right? And so if that's one, the idea-friendly environment. Another thing in these great companies is a culture of experimentation. They have the kind of organization in which people are always doing enlightened trial and error. Right? They're, they're experimenting with things, and they get extra points for the quick and dirty experiments. Right? The kind of experiments that have minimum cost but maximum learning. Right, and the, the executives, the managers in those kind of organizations, they learn the ability to squint. You know, they learn the ability to ignore the surface details of an idea, you know, and just, just look at the shape of it. Just look at it, is there promise here? Right, and if you have that ability, you start to see more ideas because people feel comfortable bringing more ideas to the table. So, and then if, if there's the idea-friendly environment and the culture of experimentation, the third would be, no matter how smart these companies are, no matter how much of a leadership position they have in the world, they still have the humility to do cross-pollination, cross what I think my friend Stephen would call exaptation, right? They, they know 
that there are always more ideas outside the company than inside the company. Mm -hmm. So they look beyond their company, beyond their industry, and often cases beyond their country for ideas not to steal, not to copy, but ideas that, that, ideas that they can adapt or shape or translate for their unique you know, circumstances of their company. And increasingly, these companies that are great cross-pollinators, they're using the tools and the technologies of open innovation, right? They are asking the world questions because sure, I'm sure you all have smart, you know, creative minds in your companies, but if you're starting on something new, chances are if you could ask the world, you'd find some PhD student in Sydney or Sao Paulo or Singapore who's already been working on this problem for a while. And so you can get a head start if you invite them to the party. So it's that combination of, of being an idea-friendly environment, having a culture of experimentation, and be willing to do a, a lot of cross-pollination. Yeah, I think one of the other observations you make as well is speed. Speed is of the essence. Right. And I think that, you know, your point about the, um, the ability to prototype and prototype quickly is so essential. So, this whole speed thing really summarizes the wireless industry absolutely perfectly. I mean, we get massive cycles in, in literally 60, maybe 90 days if we're lucky.